good afternoon and uh, welcome once again to We Got Planning News uh, for you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us once again and welcome as always to our YouTube viewers. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Um, please also consider making the usual charity donation in place of registration fee, either to the NHS Combined Charities Just Giving page or to uh, Shelter uh, or to a local charity of your choice. Now, we're thrilled uh, this evening to welcome um, somebody who's had a very easy job over the last year, <laughs> Christine Thorby, <laughs> Director of Strategy and Head of the Planning Inspector Profession for PINS. And what a year you and fellow inspectors have had, Christine. Um, thank you for all the really important work that's been going on. We're really looking forward to discussing some of that and what the future may or may not hold um, in the second half of the show, as always. But in the meantime, perhaps you could tell us where you're calling us from, um, what you've chosen as our a theme this week, um, and um, uh, what's, what you're drinking, if anything. Uh, yeah, so I am, uh, I'm in North London, and um, the theme today, Portugal, and the reason being that as soon as I saw it on the green list, I just had the most overwhelming urge to book a flight and just go, just, <laughs> just go. And uh, but you know, I don't. Nobody was prepared to come with me, and they told me it was highly risky. So uh, so here I am. But anyway, instead of that, this is uh, this is our little moment of uh, of, of Portugal. Portugal. And I wanted to show you. I found you. I found this. Can you, can you see it? Yes. Oh, yes. 1984. 1984. So uh, this is the sort of way we used to we used to translate <laughs> in, uh, in the days when we kind of backpacked around very many years ago. No fun. And I'm drinking a cup of tea. Very sensible. <laughs> Well, welcome, Christine. Thank you so much. What a great, great theme. Some of us have booked a holiday in Portugal, but more on that, uh, more on that later. Um, now it's time to introduce the panel. Um, are you, are you there, Mary? Somewhere behind the hat and the shades. I'm lurking. I'm lurking. I'm on my way. I've got my passport. I've got my sun hat. I've got the shades, <laughs> and I've got my bottle of vino, which you can drink before dinner, during dinner, or after dinner. Adira, <laughs> superb, fantastic, Mary. What's caught your eye in the planning and related news this week? Uh, what's caught my eye this week is the uh, written ministerial statement from George Eustace mm. uh, about the Environment Bill and the amendments he's tabling. And also, have you spotted that um, our friend Kit Kat has been invited to join a select few advising government on changes to the habitat regs in a Brexit world? Watch this space. Watch indeed, this space. indeed. Um, Chris, how devil are you and presumption? Yeah, so very well, very well. Uh, Portuguese theme, I like that. I have here a bottle of vintage port. I don't know if you can see that. That <laughs> yeah. was bottled in 1970. Wow, that has been in that bottle longer than I've been alive. Oh, um, stop it, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I wasn't sure about Portugal, so I contacted Rui Diaz, who is one of the many architects in Ian Ritchie's network of architects around the world. He lives in Lisbon. I said, what, what's Portuguese? He said, uh, you can't go wrong with an egg custard tart. Apparently these are big in Portugal. <laughs> And sardines from the eastern Mediterranean, eastern uh, Atlantic. Um, presumption, rather like Christine, has been learning his Portuguese. He's got the tapes in, and uh, what's that? Abrogado? Yes, he's uh, he's learning, but very slowly. I love Lisbon, actually. I think it's fantastic. My second favourite city after London in Europe. And uh, there's an image of Lisbon. Those fantastic trams that they have. This is the uh, the artist rail. Bordalo and um, yeah, I'm a genuine give me what am I? I'm not really going to drink port, I mean, it's a bit early for that. So, what I'm going to drink is a proper job because <laughs> because that's what I want to get back to real, <laughs> real inquiries for, and you know that. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, Paul, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Charlie. How are you? And in terms of news of the planning week, it's got to be that Birmingham happens to be less than Chrissy's second choice in terms of cities. That's yeah. going to be on planning news tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm in Lancashire at the moment. Um, I have got out from the, the cupboard a fantastic bottle of Vidigal, um, which has, I think, almost exactly the same picture that Chris has. And Rob might if he's yeah. cleared up. There I you go. 
That's, ah, that's the fabulous yeah. cover from this from an artist uh, who is German, uh, who is described as rather eccentric, and his name is Hauk Wald. I don't speak German, as you can probably tell. But, uh, <laughs> apart from uh, a, a little snifter of it, uh, I'm not drinking very much of it because I'm driving to Cambridge in the horrible, wet, slimy weather uh, as soon as we've finished. So not looking forward to that. But anyway, it's a delight to be Christine. Cheers. Cheers. I'll drive safe. And Sash, how are you, my friend? Good evening. I'm very well. I've been doing West Ferry 2, so it's been a journey back in time this week. Um, my Portuguese, I've completely failed on my Portuguese theme. I've I had a day of viability, so my brain is cooked, I'm afraid. Um, but I'm like Christine, I'm having a cup of tea, and I wish I was in North London. I'm currently in Central London, unfortunately. And I just wanted to mention... For all our viewers, my news point, which I'm going to come on to in my case, is the announcement of Tuesday about the Secretary of State's review of heritage policy, which we, we must all look out for. But it does beg the question of what it's going to contain, what it will do. And I'm going to expand on that when I deal with the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. Oh, I've got an apple. I should have got some sour grapes following that comment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Good day. Well, Charlie Banner from Keating Chambers here. Um, I am drinking a glass of rosé because that is what I shall be doing on a beach in Portugal um, sometime soon. I better not say, say when, just in case somebody works out where I live. <laughs> but um, so, no, I can't wait to go to, to Portugal. I did manage to book a couple of days ago. Um, so I should be sipping rosé there. Last time I was in Portugal uh, was in 2004 for the European um, Championships, which, uh, if you remember, David Beckham skying that penalty, which uh, I saw live. I don't think, as a football fan, you can, uh, you can <laughs> but you've really lived until you've seen England go out of an international tournament on penalties. Um, it was actually David Batty. No, David Beckham, the 2004 was Beckham. Oh. Batty was 1998. We'll uh, have our sportsmen's uh, Exactly. Um, now, um, let's go straight on to the, um, onto the serious stuff, and then we'll get on to the interview. So, um, uh, number one um, is going to be the Wallington uh, appeal in Surrey, which, Chris, you're going to tell us about. I am. I am indeed. So this is an interesting appeal. Uh, it is a Secretary of State case. I think if Rob brings up the title page, we can see uh, a decision from Inspector G DJ Board, who, if I may say so, made the right decision here. Uh, this was a development for a special school and she recommended approval and uh, quite right too. It's an allocated site for a special school. <laughs> That's all I have to say. No, I <laughs> uh, it's it's I just don't I really I don't understand this. I mean, it was allocated for that purpose in the development plan and the council refused it. Um, now, the reason it's a bit like what happened to me in Ledbury not so long ago, um, where the allocation was subject to policy observations about whether uh, the traffic could be properly accommodated. So that was considered as something to legitimately look at in the context of the appeal. We just have a look at the site. I think Rob's got the, the layout plan there, yeah. So um, it's in a green corridor, but that looks pretty urban to me, uh, a scraggy bit of urban uh, green corridor, I should think. And um, uh, the council were objecting really purely only on highway ground. So if we go to the front page of the inspector's decision. It's quite interesting to see why it was recovered by the Secretary of State. We don't often see this. The appeal relates to the proposals against which another government department has raised objection or in which another government department, obviously the Department of Education, has a major interest. So that's why it got recovered, one government department to another. Now, the reasons for refusal all relate to highways. The application fails to provide evidence of the efficacy of mitigation measures within the Transport Assessment, Construction, Logistics Plan and Traffic Management Plan. Doesn't get more exciting than that, does it? Um, and then number two, uh, the application fails to provide uh, sufficient evidence or data to demonstrate the site can demonstrate uh, parking for staff pickup. I've had this with a school development as well. Lots of complaints about school pickup and drop off and the amount of traffic that's generated. Now, I love what the inspector's done in this case. She's taken into account the objections. She's looked at all the different issues. Some of them aren't absolutely perfect, but on balance, she says, on balance, I think this is acceptable, particularly 
uh, given that it's an allocation. And um, uh, overall, she had no difficulty recommending approval. Well done to Lisa Bush, uh, who acted for the appellants in this case, who are Kia, who are probably going to build it. And absolutely the right decision. Well done, the Secretary of State. It's a cost decision, but I can't find that anywhere. So if anybody wants to uh, to write in and tell us what the cost outcome was, I'd be interested to see, because when we got our allocated site at Lenbury away, we didn't get our costs. Just saying. Not bitter. Ever-increasing tally of, of allocated sites that have been the subject of our decisions. I think that's number seven now this year, at least. Now, Sasha, for whom the bell tolls, you're going to tell us. It does. And I hate, I'm, this is the only time I'm ever going to do this. Charlie, you were right. You were absolutely oh. right. It was Beckham. That must that, hurt. That leaves a really bitter That's taste. Be on YouTube for the rest of eternity, Sasha. It, yes, I know. Well, hopefully Rob will play heed and he'll edit that out on the YouTube version. Okay. But I mean, I just wanted to know how long we got you, Charlie, before you joined West Brom as their new manager. <laughs> <laughs> I did once apply to be manager of Everton, actually, as it happens, a long time ago. This how did that go? How did that go? <laughs> I'm still waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I'm going to talk about the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, which was a call-in case. And interesting, Tower Hamlets is the local authority, who are my current clients, so I'm going to be very, very, very polite about them. But they were actually supporting the appellant scheme at this call-in inquiry done by the very, very experienced Paul Griffiths. I, I, Christine's face is always a picture, as we discussed, the inspectors know, but an absolutely fabulous Brilliant. inspector. And... This is a case, as we see, that was done virtually, of course. And basically, the major battleground was not between the council and the appellants, but between the appellants and the council against reform, who took the view that there was a better optimum use of the listed building. Now, obviously, this building is phenomenally important. It was a bell foundry of many, many years, centuries even, run by the Harris family, and it closed in 2017. Now, the fundamental question is heritage. And any of those out there who want to see um, heritage discussed, Mr. Griffiths does it with it amazingly well. I mean, it's probably the most comprehensive and detailed exposition of where the law and practice of heritage currently lies, because of the qu fundamental question is what would be the impact on both the listed building and the conservation area. Now, in relation to the conservation area, the inspector clearly concluded his actual very strong conclusion that the proposals would greatly enhance the conservation area. In terms of the list of building, there was a conclusion of some harm, but also of significant benefits overall. And I won't call it the Bramsill approach, but overall, in coming to that view, the inspector took the view that overall the list of building would benefit. So the inspector concludes that actually 196 overall, I don't think was engaged. And the Secretary of State endorses those conclusions and comes to the overall view that planning permission should be granted. Now, the, the other important takeaway is the inspector's very significant conclusion on optimum viable use and what is said in paragraph 196. And there, there's some really helpful guidance about the approach and also what you do. Reform had, a, had an alternative, of which the inspector considered at great length and overall came to the view that it cannot be reasonably be concluded that the reform scheme did represent OVU. Um, I must say, and I, I'm going to be a bit careful because I don't want Paul to say sour grapes trice, but this isn't a decision in my judgment that is the catalyst for a major reform of the way we approach heritage matters. I actually think it's the other way. It's a very good endorsement of an incredibly comprehensive consideration of what was at play in terms of heritage assets. And frankly, it's a model of an approach. I make no comment on the merits, of course, but frankly, the way it's set out by Mr. Griffiths is an exemplar decision. And I'd say that with the greatest respect for any potential 288 that reform might have in mind, but that's my judgment. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks very much, Sash. Um, now, uh, Mary, you're gonna tell us about Sandown Park. Yes, we're off to the races. Ready, steady, go. So this is another Secretary of State decision, this time dismissing an appeal by the Jockey Club, uh, promoted by John Steele, with Ashley Bowes acting for Elmbridge. 
And this was an, a virtual inquiry at the end of last year for a couple of weeks, conducted by another wonderful inspector, David Prentice, uh, very experienced. He wrote a 110-page report, very thorough. There was a Rule 6 party opposing the, the development. And at, uh, Sandown uh, Racecourse lies in the Greenbelt, and therein lies one of the major issues in the, in the, uh, in the proposal. So the uh, appeal related to a hybrid application to redevelop sections of the race course uh, to provide firstly a hotel, a 150 bed hotel, up to 318 residential units, quite a few separate blocks around the edges of the, uh, the course and the relocation of a nursery. And this is all in the context of the council lacking a five year housing land supply and the race course wanting to improve their facilities. Now, parts of the application were regarded as appropriate development in the Greenbelt and parts were not. But overall, uh, and indeed, so although some of the residential development was on previously developed land, because the inspector judged the proposals to lead to substantial harm to the openness of the Greenbelt, he took the view that they were inappropriate development. So overall, he took the view that the proposals were inappropriate. He judged them to be harmful in respect of the character and the appearance of the area. They wouldn't integrate um, within the, dis, uh, the local landscape or townscape, and they wouldn't deliver a high quality design enhancing local character. And, and, and this is an interesting li little point. They offered 20% affordable housing. They did that because they wished to apply some funds to the improvement of the race course. And they recited two other cases, one involving the redevelopment of the L London Irish uh, for a new club, and another, uh, the Stockport case involving, you may recall, a new school in, in the Greenbelt. And they suggested that because this development was facilitating improvements, so they could effectively offset the cost of those improvements to the race course and their viability exercise. Well, Mr. Prentice said that, um, no, that was a matter that would be taken into account in the overall balance, but it didn't go to the question of whether or not uh, the proposal complied with the affordable housing policy. So he found that they didn't comply with the affordable housing policies, uh, but nevertheless uh, took that, that point into account. So overall, breach of the development plan, uh, benefits in terms of housing and hotel, significant weight, affordable housing, moderate weight, limited weight to the improvements to the race course. None of that amounted to very special circumstances. And then the, the real kick in the teeth, because it wasn't very special circumstances, the tilted balance was disapplied and the inspector recommended to the Secretary of State the permission not be granted. And the Secretary of State accepted all Mr Prentice's uh, recommendations and dismiss the appeal. Thanks, Mary. An interesting sort of contrast with the Bradford decision not so long ago, where from the Secretary of State, where it looked like the Secretary of State might be taking a slightly more liberal approach to Greenbelt than previous decisions. On an allocated site, though, the yes, like third okay. allocated site. That's true. Oh, That's true. Oh, also, this I mean, this is a substantial amount of development. Mm, yeah. This is, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. there's quite an important character point going on here. Yes. Now, um, Paul, what rabbit hole are you going to take us down this week? Well, it's, it's nice to hear about the last rabbit hole, uh, having been on site and provided advice on that a couple of years ago. So I want to tell you what that is, obviously. It's always nice to hear what happens in the end. Uh, I love it when embarrassed to say that. I won't tell you what the advice was, but I didn't do the case. So you can. <laughs> <laughs> well inferred, Chris. Right, good stuff. Um, I'm going to tell you about a, a care home development in uh, Litchfield, or rather it's a care home with... Uh, some 95 uh, age-restricted homes and some uh, 99 non-age-restricted homes, which were ultimately allowed on appeal by Mr. Inspector Jonathan Price. And presumably, presuming Mr. Jonathan Price um, has taken a break from showbiz uh, <laughs> during the lockdown and doing a bit of work uh, on the side for the planning inspectorate. Was um, the price right? <laughs> James Bond villain, is it? And, and the great lead in uh, Miss Saigon when I saw him at bar school. Um, so it's a case where uh, uh, two members of my chambers, uh, Killian Garvey and Freddie Humphreys, clashed one with the other. Uh, it was an appeal against non-determination uh, on a site which lay outside the settlement limits on a small settlement, uh, Fradley, which is about four or five miles to the northeast of Litchfield. 
uh, on which there's been a big development at the former RAF Bradley. Um, it's a site which is not allocated in the adopted neighbourhood plan or the adopted local plan, but it is proposed to be allocated in the emerging local plan, uh, which is due for examination later this year. You can sort of get a theme from some of these appeals, frankly. Um, the, 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 the appeal was ultimately allowed because there was no downside to granting consent in relation to it. Although there was a over a 12 year um, housing land supply in terms of the general market housing, it was accepted that there was a significant need in relation to uh, uh, specialist homes for the elderly and that uh, the local plan and the neighbourhood plan and the core strategy didn't take account of that need and didn't seek to allocate or take provision of that. And as we know, it's the only bit of national policy which has the words critical before the word need. So understandably, substantial weight was given to that by the inspector who said, your plan didn't take account of that. Your emerging plan is looking at that. And even though the emerging plan isn't at, at, uh, at, at examination, uh, he concluded that the adopted plan was out of date. The presumption applied. There wasn't any particular issue raised by the authority in terms of harm and prematurity wasn't raised as an issue. Um, and the one interesting takeaway for me is that the emerging plan allocation was for a much bigger site and had a requirement for a master plan. And the inspector found that the absence of a master plan uh, wasn't of itself a justification for withholding consent in those circumstances. If you remember right back at the very start of um, have we got planning use for you? We had a case, couple of cases actually where master plans were fatal to allowing appeals. Um, I think a more pragmatic uh, stance has been taken. Certainly, I do recommend uh, Mr. Inspector Price's uh, decision in that regard, as well as the soundtrack from Miss Saigon, in which he plays a really, really excellent uh, uh, lead. Thank you, Charlie. Cheers, Paul. Thanks for that. <laughs> Christine, welcome again. Thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, really looking forward to hearing your, your insight. Um, can I start uh, by asking for your sort of brief thoughts from, from your sort of strategic, strategic role in PINs uh, on the challenges that the inspectorate and its inspectors and users have faced in the last year? Yes, you know, I, I think it, it goes without saying that it was setting up our, our virtual events. You know, we did that from scratch and then we've sustained them for the whole year. And, um, you know, this does give me a, a chance to acknowledge the work that went into that. You know, from the planning inspector, it was right across the whole of the organisation. And, you know, we, we shared resources to do that. I don't know if you noticed, some of our senior leaders were actually took some case officer roles to start with to help. So it was you know, it was quite hair raising. Some of the, you started with small pilots and we went straight into the South Oxfordshire examination, um, over 400 participants. So, you know, we're still working out things maybe three weeks before that, that started. So we've learnt such a lot along the way. Those things really helped us to develop uh, a way in which we worked, which we've been able to um, sustain over the year. And, you know, the Holocaust Memorial, you know, enormous support um, for that to go ahead, for the inspectors to be able to do their jobs. So we've done 800 events, including 40 local plan multi-day hearings. But I also want to take the chance to thank you and actually to thank all of those involved um, across the industry in helping us with that. And I think it was that working together and everybody played their part really to make sure they were successful and they're still continuing to do so. So just a yes, it was difficult, but um, thank you all for kind of working together to get us through it. And looking ahead um, to the future, um, everybody watching this will, will be aware that a few days ago, um, the inspector had announced that the most of its events would remain virtual till the end of, of this year, 2021. Um, can you tell us what are PIN's intentions for the longer term future for 2022 and beyond? Yes, we have got a project where we're looking at the future of events, as you would expect, um, just to determine a way forward. Uh, and it, it, it's a it's very complex. There's, there's so many different views. Um, it, we know that uh, there are some real advantages and we want to build on our learning from last year um, and, you know, for the whole year. We know that it does give opportunities for wider engagement, access. We know that, um, 
you if you don't have to leave home that you can perhaps open your job market in a in a different way so there's there's so many things in there that we know and have learned from but the other side of that is actually understanding the consequences of doing that and then having something that we can take forward that actually builds on that learning um, but takes us to a place where we are, are able to sustain it as a, a long-term solution. Um, you know, like all organisations, we really are looking at what the best way is to work with the, the technology we have now that enables virtual working. And it would be wrong of us not to put that into the picture for the future. Um, but I, I think it's helpful to not kind of pigeonhole it into virtual and blended, or those, those are some of the models that we can look at to, uh, for options, but, but thinking about how we use those, how we use those elements in all the different types of casework that we do. Um, and, and not losing the fact it gives us great opportunities. And, you know, as we go forward, we, we really do want to engage and consult our staff. We, we really need to understand what the implications are of the way in which they've been working. Our stakeholders and our customers, you know, everybody has a different view and we need to understand it. But this is, this is complex it's about people, it's about systems, and it's about dependencies. And so we, we really need to kind of look at it uh, as, as a matter of balance, as one of those really difficult decisions. We have to understand what the implications of different models are on our resources, on our roles, and we have to have options that we've worked through that we know we can be can be delivered. And our absolute goal is to have that reliable um, service. It's, it's part of the planning system. You know, we absolutely have to deliver that for you. And you know, you, you, you wouldn't expect us to do otherwise. But I'm sure everybody understands that within that, you know, it's, it's really difficult. And it is about just recognising those different views, and just having a place that we take it to for a resilient system that you can depend upon some people have been saying um uh, to me at least well um why is taking pins half a year beyond the government's in date of 21st of june fingers crossed for when all restrictions are lifted why is it taking until the end of the year rather than 21st of june for pins to to go back to the post pandemic norm but it, it sounds from what you're saying like um the, the future for pins events whatever it may be is going to be something different from the past and that that's why it's taking you at that time to to flesh it out is, is that right yes of course yes you know we need we need to to look at um you know i don't, I don't repeat myself but yeah we need to understand how it works and and actually to build something in um and it's not just a case of wanting to replicate the past system i mean that you know if there's an opportunity there to to improve things you know I think the the issue around the 21st of June I, I really really do understand that desire just to kind of go back to something we all recognize and that's really normal and that place where we felt safe you know and it, it, you just want to blink and go back for, for you know two years ago and in fact the sort of going from the office working to the home working with that really quick change and that the way in which we adapted quickly is not the way we can move out of it. There's just, we just, there's just so much uncertainty. You have to protect the well-being um, of our staff. We have to take that as our responsibility as an organisation. You know, we have to give you a date for an event and you need to know that you've got to have You've got to have your evidence in place, you know, your witnesses in place. We, we can't operate a, an unreliable system where we have dependencies on others who we don't know can deliver. And we, we know that, you know, councils are enormously stretched. They are like us. They've all been working from home. They've been trying to provide us with the best possible local services. They've kept planning going as you know in the same way that we have I think we all have to be really very grateful for that um, but you know just expecting them to be able to 
go back to organizing events and for us, um, you know, that kind of facilitating the virtual element, I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it just won't deliver that reliable system. And that is what we have to deliver. That's what you want from us. You know, we, we can't not do that. Um, so, yes, I, I think going... We forward, need to be patient is what you're saying, we, I think. We need to be patient. We all need, we, to, be, yeah, no, we I, all I, need I, to be patient. I know this is not, this isn't easy. And, you know, we're working with our... We're working with our staff who are returning to Temple Key House and we're having to recognise that that transition back is difficult. It's not like, oh, let's all go back and have the same working relationship we did before. It's, you know, it's changed. There's, there's changes in society and there's changes in the way people want to work. Mm -hmm. But alongside that, we have to understand the consequences of, you know, how we're working on our staff. And, and what, what it means for their workloads, what it means for, you know, running uh, an event from your home. So, you know, all of these are all really important. So, um, we do so, understand. so quick, quick fire yes or no uh, question. Um, are you able to say now that the majority of PINs events in 2022 will be in person rather than digital? I'm not able to say that. Um, Charlie, you know, there is a role for virtual events. They're not going away. Um, we, we don't know what the future of the COVID world is. We, we need to be not COVID responsive, but COVID resilient. So, so I would say just, you know, let's work together. We really worked hard to keep that planning system moving, all of us. And that's the place we need to be to, to move it forward. You know, so that's that's has a fully digital future been ruled out? Um, well, I think we know that there are places where that that personal contact is, is really important. And actually, one of the things we've been looking at in uh, some of the pilots are really trying to be creative about how we do that. That doesn't mean to say some events wouldn't be perfectly suitable for you know, for end-to-end -end virtual, we haven't we haven't ruled that out, but we know what the importance is of um, personal contact as well. You know, those are some of, that's some of the learning we've had, and if we can think about being more creative in the way we run events, and think about being more creative in, um, you know, that use of virtual hearings and inquiries, and you know picking things that suit the right type of um, event. So it's it's not about ruling anything in or out. It's about, you know, developing a really good system that we're all happy with and building in some places where that personal contact um, would help. I think my train of thought was taking me to some of the pilots, mm. not just... Um, are we going to have a, a, so these are blended events where you might have an element of virtual uh, and uh, an, an element of in-person. That doesn't all have to be in the same space. That That's the most challenging thing to arrange. Mm -hmm. And we have had work streams trying to arrange blended events, you know, over this whole period. And I think we've only actually managed you know, a handful. So we have to think creatively about how we can do it. Some options might be, you know, there is a day when the inspector comes at the beginning of an event. It might be that parts, you know, we, we use it in different ways. So I think we ought to be patient. We ought to work together to find a solution, but we ought not to just rebuild what we had. Uh, I think, you know, we do need to kind of, the world is moving, people's expectations are different. We do want to reach, we want planning to reach a much wider audience and, and for people to understand it and be able to engage. Part of the future is, of course, the um, or potential future is the, the proposal set out in the Planning for the Future White Paper to be the subject of the planning bill shortly. Um, is there a recognition in government that increased resources will need to be given to PINs if the proposed new local plan regime with all that involves is to work? Um, 
The answer to that is that, you know, clearly there's a big program that's taking place in MHCLG, as you would expect, uh, with, um, you know, ways in which this will be delivered and who, where the dependencies are. And of course, we are a dependency in, in that system. Um, we have our own program because we know we, we will, at some point in time, have to deliver our part in it. Uh, so so I, I think it's not a sort of yes or no answer, but it's a, we obviously need to be able to deliver it and that'll be part of um, MHCLG's project. They will want to enable us to deliver it. We need to know more before we can actually start working out what that future resourcing model will look like, you know, for all of us. Um, but yes, we, you know, we will work closely to make sure that, that we have the resources in, in the right place. Thank you. Now, onto the present day, um, um, hearing appeals, um, Section 78 appeals by the hearing procedure, they're currently taking around a year to determine um, considerably longer than in inquiry appeals, which obviously are more complex. Um, and, and it wasn't much different, that difference be before the pandemic. So it's not just really a COVID issue. Um, does the inspector accept that, that that's an unsatisfactory situation? You know, uh, uh, we would definitely want to have, you know, much quicker services than that. Of, of course, of course we would. You know, we don't want our, our customers to have to be waiting for a long time for our services. I think, you know, we felt we were in this position with inquiries and we did work out a, a number of options, you know, with um, through Bridget Rosewell's review about how to change things. A lot of that was changes in behaviour. A lot of that was just changing our, our processes. And that is what really made the biggest the biggest difference and bringing in resources to, to help. Um, and, you know, we had hearings insight to be looking um, at how we were providing that service and using that same kind of approach uh, to, to try and improve um, of course we want to improve but you know that is something that we've had to push back um, that is you know we we were and and are really taken up with the kind of just making sure we get our events and get the casework through the door but but of course of course and I think there's also something in there when we come to to look at that that we don't lose the opportunity to um sort of think about that again, you know, that written reps hearing uh, inquiry model, we're still thinking of them, hearings, inquiries, you know, why, why don't we look at what, what is, what's in that and see what the best way is to, to do that. And actually, um, you know, we, we work very closely with you, with, with PIBA and on how to kind of work towards really good solutions for things. And I know that, you know, you are kind of instrumental in some of the approaches to Rosewell at, alongside local government and, you know, other stakeholders. So, yes, you know, we definitely, definitely want that to be an improved service. You know, we have a model we can apply, but, but we can also start thinking about, you know, perhaps using the change in regs to, to give us a different approach. That leads on quite nicely to my, my next point, because... Um, it's quite a widespread concern, certainly amongst some people who've spoken to me about this, that in the last couple of years, there's been a, an increasing pattern within the inspectorate of appeals which are seen by those involved as obviously apt for the inquiry procedure being put into the hearing procedure instead. But obviously, a, an issue compounded with the then consequent delays. Um, and of course, the hearing procedures aren't subject to the same Rosewell targets um, in relation to inquiries. Um, is that concern well founded? Um, we, you know, we, we decide whether something's going to be a hearing or an inquiry, um, when it comes in on, on what it contains, what the issues are, how many issues, what type of, um, testing they need. And that's based on, ex you know, experience and very experienced people are, are, are looking at that and, and making a judgment. Um, you know, where there's questions, they will ask uh, inspectors. So, 
I've, I've not got any concern that there's some underlying um, aim to shift things around or that because we're running with um, Rosewell targets that hearings are suffering. Um, that that's that's not it not it at all. Uh, I think you know you raise a point. We we ought to look at that. We ought to we ought to be thinking. You know, you as part of our uh, one of our stakeholders and our customers. We we ought to look at that. Um, you know, it's not. I've I've no uh, no doubt that the, the system that we've been using is is the one that we are still looking. We've not made any kind of significant changes to that. Last last point on procedures, really. Is again, that a point that keeps coming back, that certainly to me from the coal face, like a, a users of the system, is that in a lot of high value cases, it is is pretty strong to go down the inquiry route um, for two main reasons. Firstly, as the statistics demonstrate, there's a better prospect of winning um, due to the greater scrutiny that the inquiry process involves, uh, and secondly, you get a decision within about three months rather than about a, a year. Um, which, which particularly if you've got an option coming up or something like that's about to expire, can be really fundamental. So better chance of winning and um, quicker outcome. Um, so the question is, do you think that PINs places enough weight in the judgment of, of the users, the appellants, as to what procedure is in their best interests for a just and timely determination of their appeal? I think there's two things in there. One is, you know, I really understand the point about time. I really do. And that and accept that that must be difficult for appellants um, and looking at, you know, different options will, will give them different outcomes. And that's, you know, really understand that. But it's it is about the content and not sort of best interests of, of a particular party. And, uh, you know, I, I also understand that where it's an appellant, it's their appeal, but it has to be based on what is in that um, case and how is it best to test that evidence. The second thing is that I don't agree on scrutiny and you wouldn't expect me to. The hearings, you know, it's related to the type of event, very experienced, very competent inspectors um, dealing with those matters, you know, the, the, the round table way of discussing things is is often with the right questions you know it, it's very very good um and so i you know i don't accept about the scrutiny um you know we we could spend a long time thinking about why the outcome <laughs> is different and come to all different conclusions but but uh, you know obviously on scrutiny i i'm I'm confident that our inspectors are doing the, the My final thing for me before I hand it round, one line question, one line answer. If you can improve one thing about pins, what would it be? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Not really fair. Improve about pins. Oh well, I would like to say we're practically perfect, but nobody is <laughs> you know, like Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. ask, me at the, ask me at the end. Oh, Let me think about it. I think I'll ask you at the end. Mary, Mary, you've got a, a, a question. Very good segue, Christine, Mary Poppins. Uh, this is, <laughs> my, this is my question. <laughs> what empirical evidence is there about how inspectors' workloads are changing in, in a virtual world? Uh, and does the medium, do you think, uh, this the virtual medium work mm -hmm. better for hearings and local plan examinations than inquiries? Um, I think... I think on the workload, hmm. um, I don't know that we've got empirical evidence. The workload, it's the same work. It's the same work. So you, you've got a case, you've got to, you've got to prepare for it. You know, you're doing that in the same way. Um, you, you can, you know, all our inspectors, if they need more time to prepare because it's a virtual event, they can have more time to prepare. Um, they're running inquiries in a slightly different way. Um, you know, they've got their discretion. They can organise their sessions appropriately so they proceed well. They can make sure they get breaks. Uh, and, you know, if, they, if that means they need more sitting days, then they can get them. Um, you know, the, the, the actual understanding, the evidence and... Um, the preparation and the writing up is is generally kind of the same. So I, I think in, 
in in workload it's it's different it's mm. different and it probably brings sort of kind of different stresses with it I think our you know our, our caseworkers are the ones who are often supporting kind of multiple events um, at once and so you know if we look at kind of the consequences of some of these things you can see that some roles are really different and actually I know this is slightly beside the point but uh, that Chris has um said to me uh, and others actually how nice it is to see the case officers yes. these are people they've been dealing with maybe for years and years and then they finally get to see them mm. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree I absolutely agree with that rather mm. than being a sort of um, faceless uh, email address um, yeah. I, I I agree and I think that's a uh, that, you know that's a part of the pro a good thing and part of the process mm. but I, I from my experience of all of this I, I would have thought that it does make quite a difference to an inspector's workload and, and I'm not suggesting that this in any sort of pejorative way or saying it's it's better or worse but you know when you get to an inquiry you, you can uh, allow one party to present their evidence and the other parties to cross-examine and by and large you don't have to worry about um, all the technical things whereas when you're doing this virtually you need everybody's um, everybody's computers, every everything to go right. You need yes. everyone to have access to the same document at the same time. There are so many things that, yeah. f- for whatever reason, don't often uh, yeah. don't quite work out. I think you know we've been doing this for a year, and we're very lucky actually. But we had the systems in place to to do it. You know, it doesn't mean they're necessarily completely perfect, and you know that that's an area where we if you know, for those virtual events that we we need to work out how to make that better. And, and I'm sure if you've not done a virtual event before, you know, the, the, it is going to be difficult. But, you know, once, once you get uh, going, once, once you get going and also the more you do. So that that move from, um, you know, work, work office to home. So I, I've been I've been running the directorate. <laughs> from my home and to start with you know our some of our executive meetings were clunky and things were difficult and but but we have actually because we've been able to adapted that we've adapted our meetings we've adapted the way we run things you know more and more functions have come through on teams that have enabled us to do some of those things I just want to address the final point Mary which was about different types of cases and whether there are are different you know it's it's better for different um, types of uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, I think there's just really varying views about that and that's that's the those are the kind of places where we really need to be piloting things and just just looking to see what what the options are and how best they run so, so do you think you'll be gathering some empirical evidence to inform decisions yeah yes we, we certainly want to um Yes, we do. We do. You know, we, we've got plans for how we're going to um, capture um, the, the kind of amount of time it's taking or capture the amount of resources it's taking us as an organisation. As I said before, if we want to have a model that we can apply that works for the future. We need to know what the resources are in there and we need to know how much time it's taking um, and we need to know what the impact is on, on other parties. So, yes, we do need to capture those. And there are people who are working out how to do that. Um, Sasha, so you. over to you, your question. <laughs> yes, Christine. Um, ob- I mean, the inspectorate's obviously got many elements, but the real, real only element that matters is the quality of the inspectors making the decisions. It, um, o- w- I think we all generally feel historically the calibre of inspectors has been really quite strong, really superb. Um, you've obviously done quite a lot of recruitment. Are, are you? What's your view? Are the inspectors you're getting in the recent two or three years, are they of the calibre that you want and expect? Absolutely, yes, Sasha, absolutely. And, you know, I meet them, very enthusiastic, very experienced people. And I have to say that I I feel very positive about this because the last group I went to talk to, I actually went to talk to them about uh, sort of their respective profession and to talk to them about um, my directorate. 
and they had to review afterwards. They gave me five stars out of five. So they're obviously going to be an absolutely fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. But actually, I think the, there's a, there is a sort of bigger pictures to this. And I know we, we, we are a bit caught up with virtual events and what's going on in that space. But in the meantime, you know, the kind of world is spinning and we, we've got a lot of things coming our way, a lot of things. Um, and we have started to look at what our inspector will look like in five years time, you know, through our strategic workforce planning. And that really big picture of, of things that are coming, we know, you know, the sort of geospatial strategies and the climate change and diversity, um, we know that there's kind of social changes and, and th they all do kind of come together in planning. Uh, but but what, what we're looking at is what does that mean for the type of skills our inspectors will need? And where do we find the pipelines and to make sure, you know, do we need to expand out into other areas, natural sciences? Um, do we need to grow our own? We've got already, already got in place uh, uh, getting apprentices in, um, you know, with our appeals planning officers. So, so there are some things around when you're talking about calibre and quality. Yes, we, we know we get those through our process, but also there's a having the right skills. And actually, we really would like to work with you as well and the industry on making sure we all are in that space and we are developing um, that pipeline and those, those people that we need to come forward with the right skills. Oh, your question. Yes. Um Christine, can I just uh, start off with a, with a couple of uh, preliminaries before diving into the question? The first of which is to reciprocate the thanks. Um, this, this time last year, we were all panic stricken about what, we, what on earth was going to happen in terms of appeals, what impact that would have on the economy. And it's fair to say the inspectorate were very receptive uh, to engaging with professionals such as the one that we're all members with. So a massive pat on the back. Um, and I see it from other fields of litigation where there's been really massive problems. The criminal bar, for example, have really been struggling. So I think this, the thanks also needs to be reciprocated back. Um, second preliminary, we've got lots and lots of questions, none of which we, we can do justice to. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll make sure those questions are passed on to you uh, via Rob. So um, you can see those and, and those are formally passed on. I think Charlie may ask a couple at the end. Um, and then the third preliminary is there are some things which are really right with what's happened over the last year. For example, interlocutory matters, the preliminary matters, nobody's ever going to do those in person again. We're never going to have another pre-inquiry meeting. Um, 106s with the solicitors have actually drafted them. Fantastic stuff. There are some really big things. And we're all going through the learning process. And I'm grateful that the inspectors are still engaged in terms of saying what's, what, what's the good things, what are the bad things, how can we move forward? Right, put all that to one side. I'm going to get on a hobby horse. One of my hobby horses is uh, funding. We're often told there's a problem with funding at application stage, at appeal stage. Application stage is because we don't hypothecate the enormous fees that go into planning and actually fund the planning services. That's nothing to do with yourself. On the appeal side of things, we have an essentially free system. So we've got a, a quasi-judicial process where there, there is no scale of fees in the way there is in terms of the court, court process. If you want, to, you want to bring a case for £10,000, you need to pay about £500 in the court process and it increase on that scale. Appellants are usually dealing with very valuable developments and, uh, and usually paying significant amounts for uh, the experts. So when there are pleas that we can't do hybrid inquiries because we can't get the resources in place, we can't get the uh, venue in place because the authority has not got the venue and can't pay for that. Why isn't there a dipping of the toe in the water in terms of saying to appellants, can you help out or even formalize it with an appeal fee? Uh, I, I, sentence. <laughs> well, quick, quick answer, and I, I, I think you probably know what it is. Uh, so we do have the primary legislation, um, but, you know, the secondary legislation to an actor has never been taken forward. Uh, so, you know, there are pros and cons and complexities, but it is ultimately a decision for the government to take in the round. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and would it help, uh, Christine? Would it help? Gosh. Um, well, if I could just tell you that uh, for national infrastructure, where we've, you know, the appellant, the applicant has that responsibility that we've not succeeded in you know, 
moving those forward to in a way in terms of blended events to actually even find venues so probably not 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 in the short term but something to think about I think yeah obviously something to think about certainly something that uh, Bridget uh, Rosewell her recommendations was was thinking around you know how could we help to facilitate councils but I think you know we, we, we just we don't want to just rebuild that same model I'm not going to repeat myself but something something to think about how we it's you know provide that public service and that value for money um in the best possible way so yeah in the round thank you thank you charlie um now christine i i hear a lot about kind of remodeling and change management blue sky thinking structural identity but just just on one level i was interested that you said people you know just going back to the old system because they feel comfortable about it but the thing about the, the previous system is it worked and it worked really well and pins capacity was far greater for real events and given the huge backlogs enormous backlogs on hearings i've got hearings that were lodged six months ago and we haven't even got a date you know it's not working it really isn't working and what I think is happening um, is that local authorities are being really resistant. They've never liked appeals in the past. They've always tried to push them back. Um, but if the government says that we can go to nightclubs in four weeks time, um, then I think the government has decided what is safe. Um, and PIN shouldn't really be ploughing its own thorough and saying, oh, no, we're going to do this in another seven months. And I, I, I think the problem lies with the local authorities being unhelpful in trying to resist this. They were resistant to digital events at the start. That's my view. Uh, I really do think we should get back, but everybody knows that's my view. Now, as for a solution, okay, in, in just plain English, the inspectors we meet are brilliant, okay? They're brilliant. They are patient. They are dealing with huge amounts of documentation, highly skilled, challenging job. And it, and it must be also an interesting job, Um it's a chance to do planning without the politics in a lot of cases. But everybody knows there's a lot of time spent on your own as an inspector. Most inspectors I've met say they really enjoy the real inquiry experience. Some who've retired have been more candid and said they was, that was the highlight of the job for them. Um, Alan Boyland, who's watching. But everybody, um, you know, would say surely the answer then, if you're thinking about how to do it in the future, is trust your inspectors. With inspectors involved earlier now through case management, why don't you let the inspectors decide? Because, um, you know, it will differ for them, won't it? They are the core of your business. Inspectors with young children may wish to stay at home for obvious reasons. When those children become teenagers, they might be desperate to leave for a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, why don't you trust your inspectors to make the decision about how to do this? Well, I think, you know, I, I don't I don't really want to repeat myself about it, you know, the way in which we're thinking about things and the way in which we can deliver a reliable system to you. If we've got to deliver a reliable system to you and it cannot just be um, that we look at a single perspective uh, to, to do that. We have to look at all perspectives. You know, I have been an inspector. It's Sasha and I were talking yesterday <clears throat> about a case we did Gosh, it was it was just it was ten years ago, but you know, great, great. I really enjoyed that part of uh, my work. I really did. But you know, my recollection of it is not that it was perfect. You know, there were things in it that were difficult. Not every event was, you know, that Rolls Royce system. Um, so, and also, you know, I I had to leave my family, three children. It took me a long time to move through the system to actually do complex casework because I, I couldn't do that. You know, that's that has a big, big implications for people. And it's not it's not just about personal experience. But, you know, I do it. it whatever the solution is, it cannot be from a single perspective. It has to be a reliable, consistent um, system that is part of a uh, is, is part of the system itself that can deliver. We've got to be able to, 
have understand what is in events that's the key part of it is is actually the matters and issues and to have that reason judgment and for them to be able to um you know enable development so it's just not that straightforward it's just not that straightforward and I do understand those views I really do you know I've been there and I've not run a a virtual event myself so you know I can't give that perspective but I can give the perspective of that that you know the 12 10 12 hour day and then driving home and you know do you, do you just well, yes, finding children hadn't gone to school yeah do, do you uh, yeah you could blame somebody else for that um do do you agree though the inspectors have to be the center of this don't they they, they are the key to the planning inspectorate you need to recruit them and offer them a working environment that isn't isolated. Do you accept they are absolutely crucial and fundamental to the decision you make in the future? The inspectors are absolutely critical to um, our purpose. They absolutely are the uh, independent um, decision makers and report writers and, you know, absolutely. And that is what we have to enable them to do. But the system wants, you know, you, you want an event that you know will take place, that you know, you know, that's what your client wants. Not it might be that or it might be that, depending on which inspector we get, by the way. And we know what will happen. You know, you, you, you route through who likes this, who likes that. But that's not a system that can can operate we absolutely have to um, put our inspectors centre stage of what it is that that we do and our purpose uh, as exactly as you'd expect we have to protect them that you know in what they do of course we do we have to understand how um, virtual events and running all types of events has on them and there are you know there are impacts from the personal uh, in-person ones, uh, and there are from virtual. But the absolute critical thing is to have a reliable system, you know, a reliable system that we can operate as an organisation, that we understand the risks, we take the risks, mm-hmm. we provide you with that. It's not, you know, we, we have to take that as an organisation. So, yes, inspectors are extremely important, um, but the future is is about an organisational view that we know will deliver what you want, what the system wants. Will you come back on in six months' time and tell us how it, how it's gone? Of course, <laughs> absolutely. Of course. Thank you. Great. Well, there we are. Deal. Um, final final point before we end. Um, back to that one line question. Uh, any thoughts on the one line answer? If you could mm. prove one thing about <laughs> what would it be? Only chance of um, a inspector answer the question. <laughs> my, my my brain is kind of. Uh, Don't worry, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll give you a part. Don't prove anything. Love it all. <laughs> get better barristers. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, get rid of them. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm sure everybody. Uh, Mary, <laughs> we need to talk. What <laughs> <laughs> you mean, Mary? And, and later, we'll have hugely appreciated that insight, and so we'll take you up on coming back on. Um, at late at the end of the year. Um, next week, we have um, Jenny Daly, the CEO of Taylor Wimpy, um, hugely successful uh, individual in the uh, planning industry. We're really looking forward to, to her insight uh, um, on, on her career and, and women in planning um, as one of the most successful women in planning. Um, until then, have a lovely weekend when it arrives. Thank you again to Christine, and we will see Thank you next week. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Christine. Thank you, Cheers. Christine. Obrigada. <laughs>